Hello, everybody. Well, welcome to our third week. So this is uh, class seven. And if you've been following from class one long, we are already more than halfway through. So uh, things are getting interesting, a little bit harder, uh, but more fun. So we'll continue on from uh, last time trying to see if we can cover some generative models and generative neural networks, what they are, what they do, what they can do. And um, let's uh, get right to it. So I think we are at 10.01, so there may be one more minute for other people to join in. So if you have any questions from last time or anything else, um, you can answer, ask them in the Q&A section. Um, you can use the chat for um, talking or helping other people around if uh, they need some help. And all the videos so far have been uploaded to YouTube. You should have access to all the course material. I hope nobody is having still problems accessing anything. And if you are, let the moderators know. And you should have full access to everything we have covered so far. And uh, you should have a shared drive, which looks something like this with all the PDFs and uh, notebooks in there, including today's uh, notebooks and PDF. So you can follow along using these, or you can follow along with me as I cover uh, each of these step by step. All right, so let's uh, get started then. So this is uh, lecture number seven. Uh, we are today going to recap some transfer learning we did last time. Um, we did um, build a facial recognition system that um, tried to find faces that are similar to uh, the faces stored in a database. And um, it worked pretty well, uh, I think. And um, as a homework, I gave you an assignment. If you can find a celebrity data set or just images of celebrities and try to see who looks like you. Um, and we'll cover some of that, like how to do that uh, in an easier way. So you don't have to download uh, from the web uh, celebrity pictures. Uh, you can use a predefined data set that is already there. So that's also part of transfer learning that I'll show you how to do that in an easier way. So uh, today then we'll cover variational autoencoder. That is um, one of the earliest um, generative networks. And then we will cover adversarial network as well. So generative models are uh, when you try to create new data from the existing data using existing data as, uh, as a sample or a distribution. So what you're trying to create is something that is non-existent in your data set. So this is very different from what we have been doing in the past. We have been trying to uh, find a match within the data set um, or something close to it. And in this case, we're going to generate something that really doesn't exist in the data set. And uh, it's a pretty exciting field. A uh, lot of papers have been written about GANs uh, particularly. Um, and I cover variational autoencoder because they're simpler to understand, a little bit easier to set up, and they go um, hand in hand with the, with the GANs uh, in terms of how they work. Um, but uh, GANs themselves, they are probably hundreds of papers written about GANs, and they're different kinds. The people give them different names, but they work on the same principle, and we'll cover those principles. So, uh, let's answer some questions that came in from last time. So um, one of them was, how can we tweak the weights uh, in the MTCNN model? So the version that we downloaded uh, using pip install uh, for MTCNN, it comes with predefined weights. So it's already been trained. Uh, we don't want to tweak them um, because it has been trained on a lot of data. And that's exactly why we're using it, so that we don't have to train it. So by tweaking the weights, you may alter um, the training. So you probably don't want to do that in any case. So one thing you can do is instead of uh, using the weights that came with, you can throw those away and then just use the model part uh, to train your own data set. So you can do that, but uh, don't try to tweak the weights themselves. Um, 
next question is about um, um, rotation in the face. So, so MTCNN does have problem if you rotate the face a lot because it has not been trained on uh, that kind of rotation. So usually because we are trying to recognize faces, um, it doesn't make sense to have rotated faces. You rather rotate the data set to fix the problem rather than rotate, uh, try to also take into account rotated faces. So what you do want to take into account is uh, somewhat of a profile pose, uh, different lighting conditions, uh, different um, maybe aging, uh, like some one picture is from an older version of you. So all those things are taken into account by training with a lot of data set. Uh, but uh, trying to fix the rotation problem, it, it's better fixed in the data than in the model. So next is if your database of faces is um, large, then do you have to do a lot more comparisons? Yes. So that's obvious because um, the more uh, people you have in your database, the more comparisons you have to do. Say you, you are a small company with 50 people, you have a database of 50 people and any new person, you can easily compare 50 people. As the database grows, as your company grows, for example, you're trying to do a million faces, then you may take a longer time to compare things. So then it becomes more of an engineering and system design issues. You could do a hierarchical setup where you can um, do this um, octree kind of setup uh, of data structures where you can easily compare pretty quickly. So these things are solved problems really, like you can compare uh, millions of um, data points. The vector itself is just a simple 128 dimensional vector. So easy to compare. You can encode that in some way, you can save them, cache them, uh, do all kinds of things. Uh, and I think you can still get a pretty interactive rate for even a million data set points. So, so that's uh, solvable, mostly an engineering problem. So um, let's uh, take a look at what we did. So these were the faces we tra not trained on, but we used as our database on the left side. And on the right are the different um, uh, set of uh, same faces, but different images from different times or different lighting conditions. So it looks like we did pretty well. We recognized most of them. The ones we could not, you can see obvious reasons why we couldn't. Uh, one of the images is rotated, the other one has eyes closed, uh, and the third one has um, a disguise on or, or Santa Claus makeup on. So um, overall, I think we did pretty good. So images were also different sizes. For example, Donovan's uh, images were really small, whereas uh, uh, image for Alberto uh, was uh, fairly large, uh, but they still worked. And even in cases where there were a lot of different faces in the image, it was able to pick out easily Garrett's image. And then some of these are very different. Uh, if you look as a human, it's, it's a little bit hard to find out like if they are the same person. So um, I think overall, we did a great job of uh, classifying this um, in a proper way. So, so uh, so this is uh, the strength of uh, a pre-trained network that has been trained on many, many, many data sets. So um, that's uh, something that you want to do because we are not going to be able to compete if you just have one computer uh, to train a uh, 100,000 or even millions of um, data points. And on top of that, to do all that training, you require computing resources or time or memory that you don't have probably. So it's a good idea. Transfer learning is a good thing. As long as you have the permission, you know what the data model is expecting and how to shape your input for that. Um, it's uh, pretty useful. So one thing I do want to mention uh, that I use this image uh, of Lena. So this image has been in the image processing community for as long as I can remember, uh, probably more than 30, 40 years, um, but it has um, now uh, become uh, something um, that we don't use anymore, uh, and for good reason. Uh, I think um, what um, uh, I did get called out for using this image 
So this is prevalent in a lot of textbooks and uh, all the documentation of different uh, software. So that's where I took it from. But uh, in reality, I shouldn't have used this. So this is something that I am uh, going to suggest to not use, use uh, something else uh, instead of uh, Lena's image. So what I'm using now is um, something from the paper uh, about um, uh, the ImageNet, uh, which is a generic image of somebody. Uh, so it's the same concept. You can explain it uh, without having to use that. So just a note, and thank you for uh, telling me about this. So, again, uh, just to make a note of it, and uh, let's uh, move to the next thing. So I gave you a homework uh, to find out um, uh, if you can compare with the celebrity uh, data set um, who looks like you. So um, I did um, build a model uh, and run it by uh, the images that I had. And uh, these are the results I got. So, um, and then I don't know many of these celebrities, uh, but you can look them up and see who they are. Uh, what is interesting to note is uh, most of us uh, did not have a good match with any of the celebrities in the database. Uh, few of the notable ones are Alberto, who had uh, an amazing 60% likeness to somebody called Luca Marine, and I don't know who that is. You can look it up. And uh, is Alberto on the call here? Just raise your hand if you are. Okay. Looks like he's not. So I just wanted to ask if uh, he has gotten, um, has had people told him that he does look like Luca Marine or not. Um, so anyway, so this um, is something also to be called out on in terms of like what these databases are and how they can be biased. So um, the reason we don't see a lot of match uh, is, so, uh, is because the data is collected in a way uh, that it is a uh, little bit biased towards um, maybe um, people uh, of certain color or of certain race. So um, that is something to look out for when you use uh, images of people um, because um, it's, it's possible to correct for that. I think you, it's correct, you can correct for that bias. Um, people get lazy and they use existing data sets and it kind of spreads out this bias all over. So, so when you use uh, images of people, you want to be mindful of like, what are you presenting? What are you, uh, what is uh, the bias in your data? And are you exposing that in some way uh, where uh, it's not representative of the general society? So just be mindful of that as well. So let's take a look at how uh, I did this. And uh, if you got a chance to do the homework uh, or not, just uh, you can follow along with what I did. So this is the, so it's actually even simpler than um, what we did to build the facial recognition because this time we are going to use something called uh, VGG face. This is the database of, um, uh, uh, it's not just a database, but also a model that has been trained on uh, celebrity faces. And uh, you can install it using uh, uh, this kind of command. You can install directly from Git. It will download and build it. So pip install will do that for you. So we downloaded. Let me get a little bit of a summary of uh, what this database is. And we also do MTCNN um, because we can first find out the facial regions and then we can uh, do the matching. So, um, so we're gonna create an instance So I'm not gonna run this whole thing um, because it requires mounting the drive and not everything. So I wanna avoid that uh, today. So we do the same thing. We have the database of faces um, and then we can show all these faces. 
uh, as they exist, in fact, we did last time. So what we are doing here is we are calling VGG match. So VGG match is similar to, um, to the model that we used last time, which is the MTCNN, uh, except it uh, gives us um, um, an output that is an encoding of, of uh, celebrity faces. So then we can find out how much distance away we are from the celebrity faces and each of those would give us an answer. So all we need to do is then uh, uh, take a face and then try to predict it and it will give you a prediction which is uh, uh, an output that we can use to compare. So uh, it also, the software has this uh, uh, method called decode predictions, which you can uh, call and it will give you uh, basically top five matches and you can write that in the percentage. So that's all you have to do. And uh, for each of those, I got uh, these results. Uh, and so easy to do. It does a lot of things behind the scenes. Uh, it has already been pre-trained on um, maybe 10,000 celebrities or so. Um, and um, so basically it gives you a percentage of how similar they might be. Uh, any questions on this? Wait for some questions. Okay, so I'm gonna answer one of the questions here. Can, um, so this is about like, um, are there any other resources to learn about TensorFlow or Keras? So um, most of the documentation is online. So if you just go to tensorflow.org, you should be able to uh, see the documentation itself. But, um, uh, and they also have some tutorials. There are tutorials online as well. And uh, I think uh, by the end of the last class, I should be able to compile all the resources that you want or need. So uh, keep uh, asking for them. And then I'm uh, in the process of compiling a list and I'll send those out so that you can keep learning uh, more things. Um, another question about uh, can FaceNet or Keras be leveraged to identify pet faces? Um, so that's, um, that's a good question. So can something trained on humans work for uh, animals? Um, that is something uh, you can try and see, you can just upload an image of a pet into different um, poses and see if, they, if, if the uh, model works. If not, then you would have to train. So uh, training um, is, um, means you have to acquire a lot of data and uh, Animals, uh, again, differ uh, in similar ways as humans differ. There are maybe, you may be able to pick up additional things like ears that may be uh, more visible for uh, their dogs. So, so you may have to train again. Uh, you may not be able to use um, uh, FaceNet directly, but you can use that model but train on different data sets. So, Another question is about for facial recognition, um, what is the recommended libraries for commercial application? So most of the commercial applications, um, they are going to be secretive. They're not going to tell you what they use, um, but uh, it, the algorithms themselves are very similar to what we have. They are just trained on more data. Um, they are, um, uh, also, um, the data is uh, cleaned up a bit. It's uh, combined usually with the other attributes that you can find out about somebody. So it can get pretty pervasive. So you, most people are not going to uh, tell you how they did their commercial system because that's a competitive advantage. Uh, but uh, the models are very, very similar. So it's, um, 
it's not any different than what we did, but uh, it's trained for a longer time, it's more accurate. Uh, so that, that's the main uh, difference. So another question, um, can we use recognition with the tracking? So definitely. So I think you can use this um, recognition um, live uh, with a camera feed. So because you're doing it per frame, a camera feed is just a sequence of images. So because you can do this fast enough, you can uh, uh, do it per image. So you're basically tracking the face as it moves. So, so that's a possibility <clears throat> for sure. And then a lot of uh, applications do that. And if you, uh, unfortunately, because of we are using this online um, collab environment, we can't really use the webcam. But if you are interested, I can send you an implementation which is uh, standalone that uh, can uh, get the camera frames and then track your face along with it. So that's a good question. Um, one other thing to note is that we are only doing image-based uh, uh, recognition here, we are not doing any 3D. So if you look at something like uh, an iPhone, uh, it uses 3D tracking um, in uh, combination with the uh, image tracking. So it's able to uniquely identify a face um, at uh, a fingerprint uniqueness level. But not only that, but it can also tell if somebody is um, alive um, and also it's not just a picture that you're putting through. So our system can be fooled uh, if you just show an image to the camera. Um, say you just uh, take an image and point it to the camera, it will be fooled and it will think that it's the person that uh, is in the picture. Um, so uh, it, it's not gonna work for live things. So for that, you'll have to do more processing. You have to track 3D position points and maybe have person move a little bit so you can tell that it is a real three-dimensional person. And that's what the kind of algorithm that the iPhone uses. All right, so that's, uh, I think, um, enough of the questions. And then we can uh, answer some of them uh, in the beginning of the next class. Uh, so let's uh, continue on. With our generative models. So you remember this uh, image of autoencoder. So we'll start with an autoencoder and we'll slowly convert it to something that can generate instead of just encode and decode. So if you remember this image, uh, all an autoencoder does is um, takes um, uh, essentially a set of input data and uh, compresses it down to some latent space that is uh, of a lower dimension than the input data and then it expands it back into uh, original size so that you can reconstruct the data. And if you feed it images, it will compress the images and you can use that as a compression algorithm uh, and uh, you can then expand it back into the images. So, so that's all well and good. So we found that uh, it's a nice uh, little um, uh, kind of the structure of a neural network. Um, but uh, it wasn't much useful. So an autoencoder, this particular one is fully connected, but it doesn't have to be. It could be a CNN based um, autoencoder and that is also fine. So just for um, showing it, it, it's fully connected here, but it doesn't have to be. So now uh, we take a different tag, we take the autoencoder, we train it. And what we can do is then split it into two networks, so something like this. So imagine you take, uh, you have an autoencoder which encodes it down to just say two dimensions, X and Y. And um, you have this image you are going to train. Uh, so it has been trained when it was all connected up. So um, over time, um, you would learn to encode your input image into just two variables, X and Y. And then if you put those X and Y back into the decoder part, you can get back your image. So, so that is um, obvious. And we did that uh, with the autoencoder uh, when we compressed it. But in this particular case, 
uh, what I'm saying is just uh, encode it down to just two dimensions. So that is a pretty drastic compression, but you somehow get two numbers, which then you can put them back in and you will get here. So now um, the reason it worked is because we talked about this um, uh, distributions where the original um, set of data for four, this came from this kind of distribution where this is um, this point here is uh, the particular input and all things that are similar to four, they're along this distribution somewhere in here and with different probabilities of in this distribution. And what you get out is something close enough to this four, which is the mean of this distribution. So essentially you're trying to match the input distribution somehow. So, so that's all good. And so you think now we can get clever and what we can try to do is um, instead of putting X and Y back, what if I put like just a small Delta uh, on the X and the Y and uh, that would, um, would that give me something similar to this four? Um, perhaps, um, but most likely not. So um, what we want to try to do is just add a small delta to the X and Y. And our expectation would be that it would give you something similar to the four, maybe somewhere here, somewhere here, somewhere here. Uh, in practice or in reality, uh, it's not uh, going to happen because um, the distribution of X and Y is very different from the input distribution. So a small jump in here may cause a big jump in here. So what you get out is probably not even gonna be close to what the input was. So um, everybody get this because it's an important concept. You can't just create a delta on this input, uh, on this output of the encoder and expect to get something similar. So, so what we can uh, do instead, so as I said, the latent space and the input distribution are different, so it's not gonna match. So one thing we can try is we can treat the output. So we have these two output X and Y if we treat them as the mean and the variance of a distribution, uh, then we can try to see if we, um, we can match the distribution of the input. So, so then the idea in the variational autoencoder is that you treat the output as mu and sigma, and then you sample from that mu and sigma. And now basically what you're saying is that mu and sigma of this distribution is what you are approximating and you can sample from this distribution which means you're going to get a random sample within this distribution which is going to be close to here so that would give you the expected output that is very close to the input so so that's the main idea behind variational autoencoder is that you are trying to approximate the input distribution uh, and then sample from that distribution to generate new models. So once you can sample from this distribution, um, you can use any value of mu and sigma and find out the sample and then use that to get the output you want. So everybody get that? So this is one of the most important concepts in, um, in machine learning in general, that you want to think of things in terms of distributions and what you are trying to do is match the input distribution as closely as possible through training. So in, in practice, and this could be, and this would be um, like a array of things. And so in X and Y, there'll be like two sets of mu's and sigmas uh, because X and Y for images, it's X and Y. So you can have multiple dimensions of these. Uh, so it's hard to visualize uh, but um, mu and sigma, they, they are basically representing not just, so this is a simple way to show the distribution, but in practice, the distributions are multidimensional. So it, it's, uh, it's hard to visualize it, but you get the idea. So I'm showing to you in, in one dimension, but 
usually uh, your distribution can be multidimensional as well. So, so again, this is uh, one of the most important concepts. If you get this, um, rest of the things become much easier to understand. You can think of entire universe as some set of distributions where you pluck things and things that are similar to each other are in the same distribution and you can mix and match different distributions. So if you begin to think like that, um, then um, a lot of the machine learning uh, papers are easier to read uh, because they all talk in these terms. Uh, so we'll go through one of the papers towards the end to see how to go about analyzing a paper, reading it, see if you want to use it or implement it. So they'll talk in this kind of language or vocabulary. So I want you to be comfortable with this, uh, but all we are doing is trying to find out what this distribution of the input is and then try to closely match it uh, as much as possible. So once you have that, you can get a nice continuous distribution for each of those inputs and uh, say this is the letter uh, or number four, this is for number five, this is for number six. So they're all kind of, um, I'm showing this to you again in one dimension, but it, it's um, usually a multidimensional thing, uh, which kind of looks um, maybe something like this. So imagine this is uh, number four, this is number five. So now the cool thing is that you can not only um, get different variations of say letter uh, number two, uh, but you can also have a path from two to four, for example. So if this was um, uh, number four distribution, this was number seven distribution, and now you have a path to go from four to seven as well. So you can interpolate, not just between here, but also among different um, distributions. So you can essentially morph from four to seven, uh, but not only that, but you can have some mixture between four, seven, six, and eight that you can generate a letter or number that is some combination of all of those. So when you see images um, like the celebrity database where things are being combined uh, to form new uh, kind of faces that don't exist um, anywhere in this universe, so what they're doing is they're taking two faces and they are essentially finding their distributions and interpolating between those distributions. So you can go from somebody with glasses to somebody without glasses, blonde hair versus black hair. And then not only that, but you can combine all of those four uh, different personalities into one by simultaneously interpolating um, in, um, among those four things. So the, the main thing here to get is that uh, you're um, finding things that are close to each other, uh, what these distributions look like. Um, there is um, there's a cool way to see these. So this website called projector.tensorflow.org, um, that kind of shows you the embedding. Um, it's a good way to visualize what these distributions might look like. It's not exactly those distributions, but um, let's take a look at that. So this is um, our flower database that we did uh, with the iris flowers where we tried to classify them. So this, um, we can use a color map like we did. Um, so again, we looked at this in two dimension with uh, Seaborn package, but you can now look at this in three dimensions. So, so this particular um, uh, embedding projector uh, essentially projects everything into a three-dimensional space. So it, it's a little bit nicer to look at, and uh, you can see where all the different classes are in three dimensions. And uh, this is, uh, we can find our favorite data set, which is the MNIST. So this is what the set of numbers might look like in three dimensions. So you can see they're all kind of intermingled um, in here. So what we can do is try to, um, we use,
So there's something called TSNE, which is um, uh, a technique to kind of visualize the embeddings. And um, it gives you uh, a way to see what would happen if, uh, if your data um, is mapped in a way where uh, similar things are together. So it's uh, doing that live as we speak. It's trying to move the data that is similar, um, essentially the distributions uh, for each of those um, digits. So as you can see, it start becoming clustered around that. So ultimately it will separate things out in different clusters, things that look similar. So I'm going to pause this. It's progressed enough. You use a color map. So this is what um, the distributions kind of look like. So as you see, one is kind of like this, and four is like that, and in between they are kind of intermingled. So the better separation you can get, the easier things become to classify, and that's what the latent spaces are doing is trying to figure out how these things can be separated. So again, the, all these things are basically some kind of functional transform, which uh, separates the data out in a different dimension. Uh, and we project it here in three dimension just to visualize it. So this is not what is actually happening, but it's, it's a nice way to visualize it at least. All right, so everybody get this. So what the embeddings are, uh, what, um, they mean and how this clustering happens over distributions. So that's, uh, that's the idea behind variational autoencoder. And we're not gonna program it. Uh, we will do this in the next class where we'll try to look at what happens in between as we encode and decode. So how to look at latent spaces, uh, something similar to what you're seeing on the screen, how to go about doing that. Because it's a useful skill to have so far, we have only looked at input data and output. Uh, what happens in between is not even clear to researchers what is exactly happening, but we can at least try to look at it and see uh, what we can glean from that information. So we'll cover that next time, how to look at intermediate layers and their outputs. It's a little bit tricky, but we can uh, see if we can do it with some simple data. All right, so let me take a little pause here and uh, see if we have any questions. All right. So I'm gonna answer Martin's question about, um, how do we know which output is the mean and which one is the standard deviation? So the cool thing is that we don't care. We just designate one as the other. It's how you use it um, is what will force it to train it that way. It is similar to how the output, we are not saying which one is the leftmost pixel, which one is the rightmost pixel. It is um, only because of the way we treat the output is how it gets trained that way. So, so that's the beauty of, um, of the network, um, that it will learn whatever we feed back. So remember, there is a feedback that is happening with the back propagation, depending on how you treat the loss or the output. So if you're not satisfied with the output, um, the weight or the loss is gonna be high. So the weight adjustment is gonna happen. And ultimately, the, the in or uh, output that you designated as mu and one you designated as sigma, they will become that. So uh, that's uh, something um, people trip over. It's like, how do you know which one is which? It's, um, it doesn't matter. So you choose one and it will become that over time with training. So I am going to mark as answered Bobby's question as well. So it's uh, exactly the same question with an answer really. So 
So another question about, can you repeat what is an embedding? So embedding is, um, is basically the latent space. So, which means you have taken um, a dense input of multiple dimensions and embedded it into a different space or a latent space. And that latent space can be smaller or larger, it doesn't matter. But essentially you have embedded it into a different space. So that's what an embedding is. Okay, so that was uh, the variation log encoder. So let's uh, keep moving. So then what are GANs? So, so we looked at autoencoder. Um, what we uh, did for variation is we tried to find a distribution from which we can sample. Um, what GAN does is it doesn't do this uh, intermediate step, mu and sigma stuff. It just tries to find a sample from the distribution directly. So it's not gonna do this, it's just gonna say, here's an image, it probably is somewhere here. So how does it do that? So, so similar to variational autoencoder, that instead of estimating the distribution, that is the variance and the mean, it tries to sample directly from the distribution. So the way it does it is, it first thing it does is just gives a noise image. So random noise gives it to the, network and says, hey, this is an image from your distribution. And the network says, no, it's not, because I don't know this thing. And uh, here's the difference. So you take that difference, and then you feed it back, and keep training. And ultimately, what will happen is it will start generating an image that looks like it came from that distribution. And ultimately, it gets so good that there is no difference between an actual data set image and a generated image. So very simple concept. It's kind of like a minimax game where you are taking slight adjustments, getting some feedback. So imagine if um, it's a game of like 20 questions. So initially somebody says, I'm thinking of an animal and you have no idea what it is. You just say something, say it's a giraffe and they say no, but it is, um, um, it's a, um, it's an African animal. So they're like, okay, now I have some more clues. So then say, okay, it, it's a zebra. So then you get some more feedback like, no, but uh, um, uh, it runs very fast. So now you got three, four things to kind of tweak your model. And as you go within 20 questions, you're able to kind of figure out what this animal is. So, so GANs work in a very similar way. And they get feedback a um, little bit at a time. And ultimately from a random image, they are able to generate uh, an image that looks like it belongs to the data set. So that's, that's the general description of it. There is math behind it, which is um, you can read up if you want. So I'm gonna point you to the original paper so again, this research is uh, fairly new. So it's still 2014, it's not that old, six years ago. Uh, when it first started out, so Ian Goodfellow is one of the leading persons in the field of machine learning and neural networks. So this paper is a pretty short paper compared to uh, what papers are these days, uh, but it's an amazing landmark paper uh, in the field. So if you get a chance, read the original, see uh, what, uh, he describes it as, and then there are other tutorials you can follow, but it's sometimes good to read what the original paper says about it. Similarly, there is a paper about um, uh, variational autoencoders, also from the original authors, uh, King Ma and Welling. So this was also a landmark paper, um, but they rewrote an introduction that covered the um, covered the trends in the field. So this is also a very good uh, article. It's not really a paper, it's more of a summary. So if you want to read more, get to the math behind all of this, so you can uh, read up on it. And I'll send out these links after the class as well. Um, the, again, the variational autoencoder and this uh, landmark paper on GANs. So, 
So it's easy to describe uh, now that you know what it does. It takes a random image and tries to uh, figure out uh, what it might be. So if you look at it a little bit more mathematically, and this is from the um, one of the Ian Goodfellow's talks uh, at one of the conferences. So think of um, both the discriminator um, and uh, the generator as um, functions. So the generator G is in the right side and the uh, discriminator D is on the left side. So what you're gonna do is um, uh, first we'll cover the generator because it's, uh, either it's longer, but it's easier to uh, describe. So you can take some noise and um, uh, it's a function. Um, you're gonna sample uh, from some random noise and basically generate something. And once you generate that, you're gonna put it through some kind of a discriminator or things that uh, tell you whether it belongs to the data set or not. So uh, if uh, it belongs to the data set, it will uh, answer one, or if it doesn't, it uh, will answer zero. So the goal is to make it as close to the actual data set as possible. And uh, the differentiator or the discriminator is um, in turn, all it is is a classifier. It uh, tries to see if, um, if the data belongs to the input data set or not. Or that's all it does. So it's just a zero or a one. It um, tries to discriminate between things in the data set and things outside of it. So very similar to the one we wrote for the iris classification. We had um, three classes there. Here, there's only two classes, whether something belongs to the data set or not. So together, these work in harmony and uh, try to um, figure out. So if you look at this, them as functions, this is what is happening. But uh, how do you put together a network using that? So um, let's look at that. So we have a discriminator and a generator. So again, these are just neural networks. So to the discriminator, you are going to feed real images uh, or real data. Uh, and uh, all the discriminator is going to do is try to tell you if, uh, if the image that you fed it belongs in the real data set or not. And um, it's gonna have some loss and then it's gonna update it. So discriminator is gonna get better at differentiating between real and fake images. Generator, on the other hand, is going to take noise as input and um, it's uh, going to generate an image. And that you can feed it to the discriminator. And after, from that, you get some loss, which is the generator loss, and then you feed it back. So that also gets better over time. So as things go along, um, generator gets much better at generating images that kind of look like real images. And discriminator also gets better over time, but then the generator catches up to it. And at some point, it will not be able to distinguish between real images and fake images. And that's the time you think your network has stabilized and you've learned. So then you can stop everything and then you can start generating new images as you want. So that's the idea. And um, this description here is how to set it up. So just to um, describe it more verbosely, so let's say our goal is to generate random unseen cat images. And we have with us uh, a data set that is uh, of cat images. So step one is we need a classifier that basically just classifies whether cat or not. So that is our discriminator. And um, the generator generates a random image from noise. And as we go along, we can hook them up together and uh, we have random ones in cat image. So easier said than done. So let's look at how exactly this is done. So open up this file if you have it or just follow along with me. So there's gonna be a lot of code here. So I'm not gonna go over line by line on this, but I'm just gonna cover uh, the main uh, points here. 
And what I want you to do as a homework is to kind of go through and make sure you understand all that is going on here, because there's a lot. And um, um, if you don't understand anything, um, ask me the next time, and then we can go over those points. So a lot of it is uh, API stuff, which is um, just quirks of the API. Uh, there are crucial things that I will cover. Um, and let's see how this works. So one thing to note about uh, GANs are they took a long time to run. So um, I am, again, I want to run this with uh, nice looking images that uh, have some meaningful application, but because it takes so long, we'll have to resort to using uh, black and white 28 by 28 MNIST database. Uh, but um, again, only because we want to do this in the class um, live. So most of these things, uh, if you look at the recent NVIDIA papers with all their resources and GPUs, they still train for weeks at a time. So you know, take the images, um, MNIST database, we can normalize this. So some things should be like really quick for you to understand now what we're doing here. If you see something like this, 25, this is the mean, you divide them, just normalize the images quickly. So you get the sizes and make your data set. So this is the generator. So generator essentially takes noise and um, makes it into image. So we, we don't wanna do it in one step. We wanna have enough weights around so things are kind of, uh, uh, have time to learn and weights are distributed nicely. So you just don't want a single node that uh, generates uh, noise. So you want some learning ability there with lots of weights. So we're gonna create some uh, simple network. So this is a, a cont 2 d transpose is the opposite of a convolution layer. And so we're gonna use that. So we start with noise and we create a lot of nodes here, which is a dense network um, that uh, connects to the noise. And uh, again, don't worry about the batch normalization. So leaky RELU is just another form of RELU. So don't worry about that too much yet. So, so we do basically create a dense layer. That is the first layer with a lot of different nodes. And then we reshape that into this shape and then we do this opposite of a convolution um, with uh, as if mm, this output came from a convolution that is of this filter size and that many filters. And uh, again, reshape that. So you keep doing a few of the uh, upsampling or con 2D transpose until you get to the shape that you want, which is 28 by 28. So essentially you've taken um, some noise, which is a hundred vectors of noise, and then done some transformation, created a nice little network that ultimately uh, gives you uh, an image shape. So then we uh, basically just a function to build a generator model, and we did that, and we have this noise uh, that we take in, a hundred noise numbers, and we create an image. So let's see what this looks like. It should look like, uh, no, from this. Big generator is not defined. So this should look like a random image. There you go. And discriminator is uh, exactly like our uh, classifier that we did for flower, except this is um, a convolution instead of a fully connected network. So we got um, two convolution layers. And uh, again, don't worry about the leaky RELU. It's exactly like the RELU, a little bit different. And this dropout is used uh, where 30% of the nodes are dropped. Uh, this is an efficiency thing, um, again, can live without it, it just takes longer. So we did some con convolution and ultimately we have a dense uh, connection in the final layer and one output, whether um, this image belongs to the data set or not. So that is the uh, output of our discriminator. So we do the sanity check on the discriminator, it should output some random number, which is fine. Uh, so then we do the losses, which is a 
binary cross entropy because we are doing classification. Um, and then, <coughs> so this is important here. So we treat the real loss and the fake loss as the opposites. So um, what is loss for the discriminator is actually the opposite of what the generator wants. So we do the ones and the zeros and that's the total loss. Um, and for the generator, uh, it is the opposite of the, um, because generator is essentially the fake part. So the fake part here was zeros. For the generator, it's gonna be the opposite because you want the generator to succeed. Um, and in the discriminator, it's gonna, we want the generator to fail. So they're gonna be opposite of each other. So we have some optimizers here, and that's fine. And we'll make some checkpoints because it takes time to train these things. How many things to run, that's fine. So, um, because um, things are kind of interconnected, we are not going to be able to use the fit method. So we're going to train manually. So again, remember uh, what uh, training does is um, essentially uh, for a number of epochs. So we're going to define our own training loop. So which is a for loop that we are going to run the entire data set through multiple epochs and uh, train. Um, each step and then from each step we'll get some output that you're going to save it out so again that's all this is doing so what is most important is what is the each training step do so um, as we said things are we are going to go alternate between the generator and the discriminator so first thing we're going to do is generate some random noise uh, again, we are working with uh, large sets of things. We're working at one batch at a time. So each batch is 256. So imagine we're generating 256 noise images here. So um, um, we generate the noise and this is how you do the gradient descent or at least you, how you call it to do it. So you're gonna generate images for the generator. Again, you're generating 256 images here. Uh, by calling that uh, generator function. And um, you are going to compute the losses for the two kinds, and then you compute. <laughs>